Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. My name is Mina Al Arabi. I'm the editor in chief of The National, based here in Abu Dhabi. And I'm delighted that His Excellency Khaldun Al Mubarak, Chairman of the Executive Affairs Authority and Group Chief Executive Officer and Managing Director of Mubadala, is here with me. So, I get the joy of having half an hour to grill you. Um, so, good luck in the next half an hour. Um, but really, I wanted to, to start from looking back at 2022. We meet here in Abu Dhabi in December. It's been quite a turbulent year. Of course, on the minds of many people is the war in Ukraine, as we just heard from the foreign minister of Ukraine, but also economic turbulence. We've seen tech companies go up and down. We've seen concerns about an energy crisis, about a food crisis, food security crisis. So it's been a turbulent year. But it's also been the year that many countries have come out from the COVID-19 pandemic, or at least the key measurements there. So Your Excellency, I want to start by asking you about Looking back at 2022, how do you see this year? Well, first of all, Mina, it's a pleasure speaking to you today, and please call me Khaldun. <laughs> uh, second, let me take the opportunity to um, uh, welcome everyone to Abu Dhabi. It's a pleasure to have uh, this distinguished uh, group of people from all over the world to be here for this distinguished conference. And of course, thank you so much for your kind invitation. It's a, it's a pleasure to, to be here uh, today. Um, now answering your question. It's been quite a uh, remarkable um, period if you go back to January 2020. Really, when I look at January 2020 to where we are today, uh, these two years, uh, well, three years almost now, have been exceptional in the sense it's been a period, short period on a relative basis, with no less than three arguably two for sure, but maybe three black swan events. Three black swan events happening in a concentrated period of time, shaking the entire globe from, there's not a place in the world, there's not a country in the, in the world, there's not a people in the world that's not been impacted dramatically by the events of the last uh, two and a half to three years. And that, I think, is something we have to, to start with because Everything we talk about on, ongoing for, on an ongoing forward basis, we have to bear in mind, we've just been de we dealt, you know, COVID, I think in itself, the pandemic, and the impact that that's had on everyone, followed by, which what I would categorize, in my view, as a second uh, black swan event, which is a series of economic measures by governments around the world that are unprecedented in nature. And that I will define as a black swan event, maybe a white swan, but it's a swan, yeah. depending on where you look at it. That then followed with the Russian-Ukraine uh, war, and then the aftermath, which is, I would say, the fourth, because the war itself is a black swan event, but also, again, the measures, the sanctions, and then the resulting geopolitical uh, seismic shift that has happened following that is, an, is another, you know, arguably event in itself. So all of this is happening at the same time. All of this is happening at the same time. And, you know, for countries like ourselves here in the UAE, for institutions like, you know, the investment institution I represent, we've had to navigate through these uh, waters over these last two to, two to three years. From one perspective, I would say weathering the storm or storms. From another perspective, preparing yourself for the future and this new future, because all these events I've described have implications for the future uh, that are irreversible, in my opinion. So when you say that preparation, so to speak, what lessons have you learned, and do you think we've learned institutionally in different parts of the world from these black swan events, but particularly COVID-19? So if we're going to talk about COVID-19, uh, to be specific, in terms of lessons learned, I would say there's good and bad lessons. Uh, the bad lesson is, if you re remember that first period I would say phase one of, uh, of COVID-19, which is 
the January, February 2020 to probably June, July of 2020. That's six, six to seven month period. That for me was the bad lesson. Because here, the entire principle of globalization, the entire principle of collaboration and working together was by many countries and many companies and many people thrown to the, to the, uh, to the trash and people went and countries went into self-preservation mode and really focusing purely on solving their internal problem at, any, at the cost of others. And you saw that in, in many things. You saw that in how uh, PPEs and simple things as masks were being herded. Uh, you saw that uh, in terms of the lack of collaboration in the early stages, uh, the cutoffs, you know. So a lot of events in that space really, I think, are examples of what not to do. In retrospect, you look back now, especially now going into the good lessons, the good lessons is this challenge started to get resolved in a constructive way once the world started collaborating, once the world started collaborating on vaccines, once the world started collaboration on measures, on uh, manufacturing, on uh, medical supplies, that's how the world eventually got itself out of the pandemic into the stage we're in today. It's through actually collaboration, which again begs the question on globalization, mm -hmm. because what we are dealing with right now, particularly with the other events uh, in the world today, is a move away from globalization. And I think that has, obviously, a lot of implications going forward. That point about globalization, because there are concerns that the global order as we knew it is behind us now, and we're emerging into a new global order, be it Bretton Woods, be it the, the collaboration or at least agreements at the UN Security Council, be it even trade, I mean, the WTO today, there's question marks whether it can continue, especially with the US-China tensions that continue. And so, first of all, my first question is, is globalization dead? Is it still there? I, would, I don't know if it's dead, but it's certainly highly challenged and uh, facing probably one of its, its biggest challenges ever. Uh, I think the form of globalization that we've seen over the last uh, 10 to 20 years is probably behind us. Mm. Now, are we moving into uh, something completely different? Uh, I don't know the answer to that, but I do think that I think there is a new form of globalization that's emerging uh, that is different than the form we've seen over the last 20, 10 to 20 years. And this new form is shaping itself uh, along the lines of uh, the China-U.S. divide, along the lines of Russian sanctions, along the lines of uh, the rise of India. Uh, so many, uh, the, the movement of uh, the supply chains or the reconstruction of supply chains uh, moving from a complete open market of supply chains to now a model of uh, domesticated supply chains as a focus combined with trusted supply chain circles. So I think that's what's emerging and, and probably the form of globalization is, is more along the, same, the lines of this, uh, you know, talking in economic terms, along the lines of this uh, economic value chain trusted partnership. That's, and you're seeing these circles of partnership uh, build up now. Now, how sustainable that is, how that's going to work out, how it's going to shape, I think it's happening uh, as we go. Uh, but I believe, you know, personally, as, as you know, the UAE has always been a country that's built on trade, mm -hmm. built on open trade, uh, east, west, north, south. Uh, we are supporters of globalization. We're supporter, supporters of open trade. Uh, and and we've, you know, we've reaped the benefit of it over the last in you know, 50 years uh, of, of the creation of this country. Uh, and that, I think, allows us to operate the way we operate today. And if you look at the UAE today, uh, our trade partnerships with, with Asia are very strong, from China to Japan to Korea to um, India, Southeast Asia. And then you go to Africa. We are you know, the, the largest trade partners of, of Africa. You move into the Middle East, pretty much every Middle East country, we have a strong trade relationship. And then you go into Europe. 
the United Kingdom, the United States, and, 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 and I think the same. So you see a very similar uh, trade-oriented direction that the UAE has, has pursued. And I believe, regardless how uh, this question gets answered and how this plays out in the 10, 20 years ahead, I think for us in the UAE and for our investment institutions, we will, I think, do well in that world because we can and we will continue to speak east, west, north, south with a very, uh, I would say, constructive approach. But, but that approach and those relationships for the UAE are born out of that global system that now, as you say, is challenged. So as you do your strategic planning, as you're looking forward and thinking about, you know, as Mubadala, for example, looks and has incredible ties in different parts of the world and investments, do you now pause longer and think you can't take for granted that those global uh, relationships and systems that perhaps we took for granted 10, 15 years ago? And how do you then, how do you then plan accordingly? So, again, from a, from a, from a pure investment uh, lens, mm. and as I look from my, uh, from my chair at, at Mubadala, as, as an investor, as a global investor, we follow growth. We follow growth patterns. Uh, we follow long-term sustainable return. Uh, that's kind of what drives us. Uh, and that applies, by the way, both in terms of geography and sectors. This is how we look at the future. We don't, we are, you know, I'd like to use this word probably agnostic in terms of uh, where and how uh, our, uh, our track record has been based on investing in the right sectors at the right time and in the right geographies. And in doing so, we were able to achieve and have been achieving consistently uh, sustainable, attractive returns for our shareholders. Going forward, we will continue to do so. So when I look at growth, as an example, on an ongoing forward basis, okay, uh, you look at Europe as an example. I think it's a challenged picture when you look at, when, when you put the, 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 the description I've just described in terms of growth, in terms of returns, in terms of uh, where I see economic headwinds. I think when you look at Europe, that's a challenged picture. On the flip side, you look at India as an example. India is a, is, a, uh, is a country that is, um, is going to be the largest country by population probably 2024, next, in the next one to two years. So huge population, 1.3 to 1.4 billion people. The largest uh, growing middle class in the world by size. Uh, one of the largest growing economies. I think, you know, six, seven, eight percent GTP growth on an economy that size, closer to the eight percent, if I'm not mistaken. So, again, you have a GTP growth trajectory, you have a rising population, you have a rising middle class. I think there you can see, again, a, a picture, coming back to my growth argument, where you see growth. Mm -hmm. And you see growth and you see sustainable growth given the outlook, uh, the macro outlook uh, into, into a country like India. So then you, then you ask yourself, okay, what sectors? And here, again, I'm talking from a macro sense. You know, there, there are sectors that we all know today. Our sectors, you know, given the world direction, is an area that you will see substantial growth in. Mm -hmm. So, you know, l let's take a broad theme, energy transition. So that entire theme of energy transition is a theme that, of course, we're focusing on investing in because we know the future is going to be about energy transition and about investing within that value chain uh, of, of energy transition. And, and that applies to everything from uh, investing in, in production, manufacturing, uh, materials, uh, all the way to uh, the kilowatt produced from solar, uh, wind, or, uh, or you know, hydrogen, etc. So I think that is a, you know, a broad theme uh, that I would say is an area of focus to us. Technology is very important. Technology, you know, again, is at the forefront of everything. And uh, be it the energy transition, be it the healthcare side of it, the biotech side of it, uh, the consumer side of it. Uh, while it's going to be challenged, I think, in terms of valuations, particularly um, in North America, Europe, but also China, uh, as we speak, it's being challenged. It doesn't change the long-term uh, relative importance and criticality of that sector and as a long-term investor is an area I assure you we're focusing a lot on. 
So I wanted to ask you about industries, industries to focus on. So you've mentioned energy transition, and there's you know, many questions about, of course, the UAE being one of the leading uh, countries when it comes to hydrocarbons, but also thinking about that transition from Mazdar, which is going through its own uh, transition at the moment, to hosting of COP28 uh, in 2023. So when you think about industries, but also policies when it comes to the energy transition. And we're here at the World Policy Conference, you know, if you're giving advice to policymakers, how do they uh, calibrate that energy transition that is inevitable now, but also how does that fit into the planning for COP28? So, I think I will answer you by uh, starting with uh, context. So, from, from a UAE perspective, energy is has always been the backbone of our economy. Again, we're blessed in terms of the natural resources we have in the UAE, uh, oil uh, and natural gas. And, and, and throughout the 50 years, that's been an important component of our, uh, of our economy and uh, of our GDP. But throughout that period, the policy question and the policy vision that the, the UAE has always had consistently is a policy of diversification from one aspect and a policy of maintaining leadership within the energy space. And in doing so, when we talk about energy transition, while this is the, the, you know, the subject of the day in, in any, any, any platform you talk about uh, t today, we've been talking about energy transition for almost 16 years. You know, wh when you look at where we are today as one of the largest oil producers in the world, one of the largest gas producers in the world, yet already, Almost 25% of our power needs in the UAE are met through renewables already. That didn't happen uh, over the last two years. That's happened over the last 16 years of consistent investment in a time where I remember 16 years ago uh, when we started investing in, in solar. Uh, you know, people were saying, well, why is the UAE investing in solar? You have oil, you have gas, well, why, why are you investing in solar? or even 14 or 13 years ago when the UAE decided we're gonna build nuclear power plants, safe nuclear power plants. Why are you investing in nuclear power plants? You have plenty of gas, plenty of oil. I think you know, that shows you, I think there was a level of maturity and clear long-term view in terms of where the energy is going uh, from policymakers in the UAE and the leadership in the UAE that's led to decisions you know, 14, 16 years ago that we are seeing today the benefits of, you know, we have today uh, four and a half gigawatts of nuclear power in the, in, in the grid today. Safe nuclear power, supplying power throughout the grid in the UAE. We have two of the three largest solar plants in the world, power plants, generating the lowest uh, cost per kilowatt in the world of solar energy. This is not, I'm not talking to you in theory or in future plans, I'm talking to you about you know, actual uh, infrastructure operating in the ground today and producing the, this, this power. So I think that story of investing in, 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 in energy, investing in new energy and the energy transition is a, is, is a long story for us in the UAE and it's showing its fruits and, and where we are today is where we would want to be, I think, uh, in the sense of having that balanced portfolio of energy production between renewable and conventional uh, in a way that I think no other uh, not many countries around the world has, but more importantly, no other major oil and gas producer has. And as we enter, sorry to long answer, and as we enter now the year where the UAE will, UAE will be hosting COP, uh, the COP, you know, I think we have a good story. We have a, a, a great story, in my opinion, in the sense that, you know, it's the story of an energy producer that, is, that has made the transition, or is making the transition, with actual historic evidence of that and a clear strategy. When we say we're going to do something over the next 10 to 20 years, I think the track record of the UAE shows that it actually delivers on that. And I think that will be a very important theme as part of COP. Now, the, the, I want to follow on from that and, and the point of investment, because as a sovereign wealth investor, there are certain responsibilities to ensure development, growth, but also now these new developments, new when I say, you know, 10, 15 years, thinking about 
climate transition or climate action, energy transition. But at a time that now we're entering economic turbulence in 2023, I mean, all the outlooks, be it the IMF, um, be it the World Bank, are talking about globally, we're going to enter a time turbulence. So can you s still feel as assured that that long-term vision, strategic planning, will be okay at a time when we have this economic turbulence? And there's a fear that financing globally on this energy transition and so forth will pull back because of fears. So here I think there's a, an important say, saying, patience is a, is a virtue. Uh, I think what is required is, <laughs> and I'm going to contradict myself, so for, forgive me, but I will, I, will exp I will elaborate as I go with my answer. It's, it requires patience, but also speed-like execution. Mm -hmm. and, and these two have to happen at the same time. And what do I mean by that? So, a couple of years ago, there was a lot of pressure. And just using that example on, uh, on energy transition, because I think it's probably the best way to, to, to explain my, uh, my argument here. So, maybe over the last five to ten years, maybe more five to eight years, uh, as this energy and uh, climate challenge has, has, has really come to the forefront, a lot of pressure was put on policymakers, on, on, on governments, and on companies, oil and gas producers around the world. That resulted in a stress to the system. That stress resulted in significant underinvestment in the oil and gas sector and the energy sector as a whole, globally. That then resulted into a undersupply. So inevitably, there was going to be a uh, wall you're going to hit because it assumed wrongfully, in my opinion, that there was going to be you're going to stop investing in this space, you're going to invest heavily in the renewables and, and, and new energy space and energy transition space, and it's all going to happen at the same time, and it will be smooth, and there will not be extreme volatilities. Uh, the, the reality is, is, is that's not the case. Uh, the, you know, where you need uh, you know, uh, execution speed is on new technologies, on um, uh, the future of energy transition when it comes to wind, energy, sorry, uh, solar, hydrogen, ammonia, there's so many. That requires speed of execution, but it also requires patience. It also requires patience. And then to, to be able to measure that with continuing to invest in a responsible way, in existing energy demands and supplies needed to meet these demands in the conventional space. Mm -hmm. Without doing so, is going to create massive disruptions and massive volatility and economic distress. So this is where I feel it's important to achieve that balance between patience, perseverance, but also, I think, execution and light, light speed execution in a period of time that is more structured, that will help, I think, the world economies uh, balance better uh, some of the challenges that lie ahead. Now, part of the, the challenges are also these changes in technology landscape. Partly because there's the speed of technological change that regulation, sometimes government, is not fast enough to keep up with. But also, there's the concern, if we go back to the globalization question, that there might be a split. Some people have talked about decoupling between the US and China. There's been pressure on countries in different parts of the world to act, make a choice. Technologically, geopolitically, yes, but I want to talk about also the technologies. How do countries like the UAE, mid-sized countries, but also investors, think about that? You know, as technology is speeding along, there's the geopolitics that might pull back. So here, I like, from my perspective, always to look at it agnostically. Invest in the best technology and invest in the areas where you have the right regulatory environment, the right you know, uh, legal environment, the, the right uh, you know, uh, macro environment that is uh, conducive for growth. Mm. That's what drives our decision. It's not about the geopolitics or X or Y. It should be in that sense. Uh, when you look at, for instance, you know, uh, the, the, the PV solar market as an example, 80% of the manufacturing is in China. That's the reality. 
Today, 80% of the supply is coming from China. Uh, and that applies to many other components within the, uh, the energy transition stage. If you look at it, anodes uh, and various components, m you, you, I can name you five or six important components that are critical aspects of the energy transition. Each one of them, China manufactures between 50 to 80 percent of global supply. So I think you know, we, one has to be you know, clearly balanced in how you look at the future and, and, and how do you get to that future in the way that is most sustainable and most uh, economically uh, viable. I go back from our sense, you know, we, we've been investing uh, in uh, everywhere around the world for decades, uh, and we tend to invest where it is the right place for that right investment, for the right return for us, and we will continue to pursue that strategy. Now, the other change that we witnessed during COVID-19 was, of course, our over-reliance on connectivity, technology, everything from, you know, working from home, children being educated at home, but also, you know, public health in general. So technology and changes in the technology landscape are impacting governance, impacting economies, and so forth. How do you view the changes in the technological landscape, and what are you excited about? Well, I'm excited about everything. I think you know one of the positives of COVID is it, it supercharged our uh, transition on the technology side. So you look at a simple technology like virtual, uh, like the virtual Zoom calls. By the way, they all existed pre-COVID. Just nobody used them or used them very, very scarcely. But they are, this is an, an, a, a tremendous technology uh, platform mm -hmm. that you know all of us who've been dealing with this over the last couple of years will tell you. Oh, wow. Why was I traveling all over the world for meetings that I could have done at home with my computer and without, you know, the need to... So I think I look at the use of technology and how it makes our lives easier, makes operating, doing business easier as a tremendous asset. And I think we've learned to, uh, and I think that's one of the great things, we've learned to pivot fast, accept these technologies and actually use them. Now, I don't think we have to be extreme uh, we needed to be extreme during COVID because of the various restrictions, but I think there needs to be a healthy balance between the use of technology and, because nothing at the end of the day replaces what we have here today, which is the ability to, to speak, converse, see the body language, have the interface. Uh, I am, you know, personally back to my travel mode in 2019, and as much as I would have liked and hoped to believe that uh, through technology and virtual communication, I will need, not need to travel like I used to before. The reality is the answer is no. N nothing replaces this direct connectivity, the, the, the need to actually look someone in the eye uh, and, 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 and really converse. And, and, and that applies to business, politics, academia, you name it. Mm -hmm. uh, conferences, you know, <laughs> you know, you've all attended conferences, frankly, on a virtual note. I think none of us want to go back to those days of at attending a conference virtually. Now, having said that, technology is, is changing everything. And, and, and now, even the way we work, uh, the ability for us to work, and, and I, can, I see it with, with, with our workforce in Mubadala all over the world right now. You know, we have offices throughout the world. Uh, the ability to, to now mix between technology um, and, and, and that face-to-face -face and creating this new hybrid model, whatever it is, and it's an evolving model, is I think good because what's good in it is it provides a better balance in terms of quality of life. And that is critical. That balance between work uh, and life is, is so important because we've seen it now. We've learned through COVID that, by the way, productivity hasn't changed. As a matter of fact, I found that productivity got more enhanced when we were able to provide our employees a better work-life balance. So I think technology will play a big part in this going forward, and, um, and employers will have to evolve. Uh, we cannot go back to pre-2020. That's, that's finished. Mm -hmm. There's something new, and, it's a, and, it's, and we're all learning it, and, it, and what fits in Abu Dhabi is different than what, what fits in Paris, and what fits in Paris uh, won't fit in, in Tokyo or in Beijing, etc. There's going to be, uh, but I, you know, sorry, short answer, Technology is crucial. It's going to be great. Uh, I, I, I love most aspects of it, and, and it's about us uh, investing in it, using it, and then uh, having the courage to, uh, to, uh, to test it. 
Okay, and my very final question for you. We started by looking back at 2020 to 2022. Now, as you look forward to 2023, uh, what do you see as the greatest opportunity we have in 2023? So, uh, listen, I'll answer you in a, in, a, in a different way. We, when we look at the future, we don't look at it in one year. Mm. I think, you know, I, I, you know, as an investor that looks, that takes a long-term horizon, and being a sovereign investor, that gives us, I think, an edge in that we can afford to think, and we, we are afforded to think, in the five to 10 year horizon. And that changes your, your, your decision making when you're looking at a five to 10 year horizon versus looking at a one year horizon. So if I'm looking at a one year horizon, yes, 23 is gonna be tough, <laughs> no, matter, no matter how you cut it. You know, okay, there's some places it's gonna be easier than other, but I think there's more headwinds than tailwinds uh, in most places around the world for 2023. So it will be a tough year. Now, from my lens, it doesn't really change because we'll weather 23. The decisions we do in 22, this quarter and 23, I look at it in the, terms of, in the lens of the next five to 10 years. Are we making the right investment decisions in the right spaces, in the right sectors, at the right valuations, looking at a five to 10 year horizon? From that sense, 23 will be a tremendous opportunity. So I'm not gonna look at it in the negative sense, I look at it really actually in the positive sense, because I think it's, it's, a, it's a time where there's gonna be uh, big adjustments on valuations, there's gonna be recessionary pressures, pressures in many places around the world. Uh, some countries will go into recessions, some economies will go into recessions, others will go into, some into you know, strong recessions, some into light recessions, and others will, will, will weather through. So it's going to be a tough year. I mean, I, I anticipate that, but I see that in the, in the lens of opportunity. And in that sense, I think 23 will be a very important year for us as Mubadala uh, if we make the right decisions. Uh, I think uh, over five to ten years, these decisions will be, will be very uh, creative for us. Well, thank you very much, Khaldun. We, we close the session with thinking about patience, but also speed and agility, uh, knowing that 2023 will be bumpy, to say the least, but also looking at the five to 10 year horizon, some exciting opportunities, but also following where we see growth. And as you said, the world's landscape is changing according to that growth, both in industry and in countries. Thank you very much for your time and your attention. And please thank my delightful speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.